Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church. This is the show where we sort through the flotsam and jetsam of the past week in terms of news about the Vatican and the global Catholic Church and try to extract those few nuggets of gold that illuminate and illustrate the story of our times. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with a Polish polemic on the Pope, only in this case, not Pope Francis, but the late Saint Pope John Paul II. Second, jousting about Germany, a controversial vote over the blessing of same-sex unions in Germany continues to have reverberations around the Catholic world, including in Rome. We'll break down what's going on there. Third, Al-Sistani and the Shiites, how a letter from Pope Francis to a fellow spiritual leader sort of captures in miniature the special relationship that exists between the Catholic Church and the Shia branch, the global Islamic family. Fourth, battle in Beichu. Italian Cardinal Angelo Beichu continues to decline to go quietly into that good night. Instead, he is putting up, he is raging against the dying of the light in the Vatican's trial of the century. Last week was not a particularly good one for Beichu in terms of the evidence presented at trial, but this week he actually may have gotten a boost from a somewhat unexpected source. We'll break down what's going on there. And then finally, of baseball and brotherhood. Why the story of the plucky Italian squad in the World Baseball Classic currently unfolding has me thinking about the special relationship that binds my home country in the United States and my adopted country here in Italy. All that and more is waiting for you on Last Week in the Church, so please stick around. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, March 21st, in the year of our Lord, 2023. Last week, of course, was a pretty good week for Pope Francis. Last Monday, March 13th, he marked his one decade anniversary in office, the 10th anniversary of his election on March 13th, 2013. This week, however, in the wake of the anniversary, was, as so many weeks over the last decade have been, something of a mixed bag for the pontiff in terms of the news harvest. We begin in Poland, where a new polemic has arisen regarding the pope, only in this case, not the sitting pope, that is Pope Francis, but rather his illustrious predecessor, the Polish pope, St. John Paul II. A Polish television broadcaster known as TVN recently carried a documentary in which they covered the cases of three priests who had served in the Archdiocese of Krakow during the time that the future John Paul II, then, of course, known as Cardinal Karol Wojtyla, was the Archbishop of Krakow. And these three priests all had charges of sexual abuse lodged against them. Two of them ended up eventually being convicted civilly and doing jail time for the sexual abuse of minors. And according to this report on the Polish television network, these charges were known to the future pope, to Cardinal Wojtyla, and essentially covered up. That is, these priests were transferred to other parishes rather than being removed from the priesthood or otherwise subjected to some kind of ecclesiastical punishment. This report comes at the same time as a new book by a Dutch journalist who lives in Poland titled Maxima Kolpe, John Paul II New, which is also about a handful of cases during the years that the future pope was the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow. Again, the claim is that there were accusations, known accusations of sexual abuse against a small number of priests known to then Cardinal Wojtyla, and once again, either the reports were ignored or minimized, or in any event, these priests were given other assignments without any public acknowledgement of the charges against them. Now, what this has caused is a kind of enormous public eruption in Poland, where some inside and outside of Poland's Catholic Church are suggesting that 
this ought to occasion a rethink about John Paul II's legacy, perhaps taking a more critical view of that legacy. Others, however, are insisting that this is a sort of, well, unsavory attack, an attempt to steal the halo, in a sense, of Poland's most famous and most celebrated Catholic. That is very much the position of the country's governing law and justice party, which pushed through a parliamentary resolution denouncing these negative reports about John Paul II and basically affirming, you know, what a great Pole and, and great guy he was. Not coincidentally, parliamentary elections are scheduled for Poland later this year, and all indications are that the Law and Justice Party, which has very close ties to the Polish Catholic Church, wants to make the defense of John Paul's legacy a kind of wedge issue. Polling suggests that doing so could be a very successful tactic because, you know, John Paul's poll numbers, his approval rating is still pretty high in his native country of Poland. Now, you know, look, as this reexamination of John Paul's record plays out, there are, there are going to be those who want to push the envelope in terms of trying to find other examples, perhaps, in which the Pope, the future Pope, dropped the ball. Others are going to want to defend John Paul's legacy. Some of the critics of these reports point out, for instance, that both the television report and the book, in part, rely on files from the Polish secret police during the communist era, which notoriously wanted to tarnish the reputations of Catholic priests, the suggestions being that some of these reports may not be completely reliable. All of that is going to have to be the subject of historical debate. But as that unfolds, there are just two points I would like to make by way of perspective. One has to do with the theology of sainthood. The other has to do with just basic Christian spirituality. So first, when it comes to the theology of sainthood, it should be pointed out that when the Catholic Church declares a pope a saint, it has always been understood. That is not tantamount to saying that every decision they made as a pope was beyond dispute. I remember very clearly when Pius IX, Pope Pius IX, was beatified in the year 2000. The Vatican spokesperson at the time, Spanish layman Joaquin Navarro Valls, took pains to emphasize that did not mean that the church was saying that every choice Pius IX made as pope was correct. For instance, it didn't mean that his decision to put the Jews of Rome back into their ghetto after a brief emancipation was the right call. Instead, what the theology of sainthood says is that when we canonize a pope, we're saying that despite whatever failures or errors may have characterized their papacy, you know, basic human limitations on judgment, nevertheless, there was a sufficient holiness of life in that person's story to make them worthy of emulation, that they are a role model of holiness despite their human limitations and failures. Okay, so that's point one. Point two, which just has to do with basic Christian charity, I suppose, is that nobody's legacy ought to be reduced to their worst day. Is it possibly true that John Paul II dropped the ball on some cases of priests accused of abuse? Can I point out to you, he was the Archbishop of Krakow from 1964 to 1978, the period at which, numerically speaking, the cases of sexual clerical abuse were at their peak and when the consistent pattern all over the world was to treat sexual abuse the way you treated alcoholism. You sent these guys off for treatment and then put them back into the field and you did it all quietly to try to give them a chance to maintain their good names. We didn't understand back then the dangers of recidivism. We didn't see these situations through the eyes of the victims. This was the pattern across the board. It would actually be stunning if during that 14-year period there weren't at least a few cases on the future Pope's watch that slipped through the cracks. Does that mean, therefore, that John Paul's halo needs to be removed? You know, I don't know. But I would be, I guess I would be skeptical if a balanced historical judgment on John Paul would conclude that because of a limited number of failures in one era, therefore everything else he did somehow doesn't matter. All right. Secondly, jousting about Germany. So the Germans' unique, what they called synodal path, so not quite a synod, but a synodal path, wrapped up 
this month with and reached a crescendo with a series of votes on several controversial matters, one of which involved the pastoral practice of blessing same-sex unions. Now, to be clear, this has been going on in parts of the German church for quite some time. Individual pastors have made the decision, sometimes with the support, either implicit or explicit, of their bishops to offer these kinds of blessings to same-sex couples, but it has never been officially ratified. I suppose one could say by ecclesiastical leadership. In the concluding acts of this synodal path, there, there was a vote which went in favor of the blessings of same-sex unions. That vote was seen as at odds with the Vatican's official position, which was expressed in a 2021 document from the Vatican's then congregation, now dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, basically saying that to bless a same-sex union was to essentially to endorse sin and that no priest had the right to do that. And so this vote by Germany has been seen as to some extent a defiance of official church teaching and practice of the church, even as it has been elucidated and presented by Pope Francis in his top aides. This week, Asked by reporters for a reaction to the German vote, the Pope's top aide, Italian Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, said that, look, this vote in Germany is at odds with that 2021 Vatican document. It is at odds with the official teaching of the church. And he said it has to be discussed at a universal level, that an individual country cannot simply strike out on its own. Now. Paroline took pains to try to dampen some of the, you know, the emotions surrounding all of this. He noted, for instance, that the Germans had decided not to implement this vote until March 2026, three years hence. So he was grateful for that. He also said he didn't want to talk about rebellion in Germany. He said, you know, in the church, there have always been tensions and differences of opinion and so forth. But said, all this has to be discussed as part of the synodal process initiated by Pope Francis, which will culminate with an initial summit of bishops in Rome this October and then a final one in Rome next October. The, the plain situation is this, that the Germans have endorsed a measure which is at best ahead of a reform process in the global church and at worst in direct defiance of the official teaching and position of the church, as elucidated by Pope Francis in his team. What we don't yet know is how that's going to be resolved. Basically, the Germans have said, well, you know, we had our vote. We're comfortable with where we ended up. The Pope's top aides are saying, well, no, you really can't do that. This has to be subject to a universal discernment. How that's going to be resolved, we don't know. What we do know is that both sides seem to have bought themselves three years to figure it out. So we'll just have to keep an eye on what happens during the Pope's senatorial process to see what implications that might have for the ferment in Germany. All right, third up this week, Al-Sistani and the Shiites. So the Grand Ayatollah Al-Sistani is, his residence is in the holy city of Najaf in Iraq is widely recognized as probably the most authoritative figure in the Shia Muslim world. Pope Francis met al-Sistani on March 6th during his trip to Iraq in 2021. And that meeting came on the heels, of course, of Pope Francis's famous meeting in the United Arab Emirates with the Grand Imam of Al Hazar. Al Hazar. Thank you, Elise, my wife. I blocked for a moment. Al Hazar, the, the mosque and university in Cairo that is widely regarded as the Vatican of the Sunni Muslim world. The Pope and the Grand Imam had signed the document in human fraternity. So the meeting with Al Sistani was seen as a kind of part two of the Pope's outreach to the entire Muslim world. What is most interesting, oh, and so what happened this week was the Pope sent a letter to al-Sistani. It was delivered by his top aide for interreligious dialogue to al-Sistani. 
basically recalling that meeting on March 6th and talking about how important it is that the religions come together in the effort to resist extremism and violence to promote tolerance and brotherhood. Now, what is remarkable about this, aside from the fact that the Iraqis in the wake of that meeting declared March 6th a national holiday, they call it a day of tolerance and coexistence. Aside from that, what is interesting is that it is a reminder of the special relationship that binds Roman Catholics in the Christian family with Shiites in the Islamic family. Here's why. In some ways, Islam is the mirror opposite of the Christian world. In the Christian world, you have this divide between Catholics and Orthodox on the one hand and Protestants on the other. Catholics and Orthodox are clerical. They are liturgical. They believe in scripture and tradition, very devotional sort of expressions of Christianity. Protestants, on the other hand, are sola scriptura, that is, scripture alone, salvation through faith alone, and as opposed to being clerical, they tend to be congregationalist and lay lit. And in the Christian world, the sacramental, clerical, devotional side of the ledger is about two-thirds, and the sola scriptura side is about one-third. In the Islamic world, it's the mirror opposite. You have the Sunni branch of Islam, which is about 80% of global Islam, which is the analog to Protestantism. There aren't any clergy in the true sense in Sunni Islam. There is an emphasis on the Quran alone as the authoritative source of revelation. There are no saints. There are no real popular devotions. It is, in some ways, a kind of Lutheran expression of Islam. Shia Islam, on the other hand, which accounts for about 20% of the global Islamic population, which is about 1.6, 1.7 billion. Shia Muslims do have clergy. They have a highly devotional approach to their faith. They have saints. They have a theology of sacrificial death and atonement. In other words, the parallels with, with Catholicism are quite striking. And, and veterans of Catholic-Muslim dialogue will tell you that when Catholics and Shiites are both present at Christian-Muslim dialogues, they have a special affinity in a way that Sunnis and Protestants tend to have a special affinity. Now, what makes all this relevant is that although Shiites may only be 20% of the global Muslim population, they predominate in the all-important Persian Gulf region, including, of course, in portions of Iraq and in Iran. And we all know that strategic relations between the rest and the West and Iran these days are troubled. And the Catholic Church, because of this special affinity with Shia Islam, has the opportunity to be a bridge builder, to be a meeting point, and to facilitate dialogue. And that is a unique and precious thing. And so the Pope's correspondence with al-Sistani this week is a reminder of that perennial opportunity that the Catholic Church has to make a real difference in the sort of global chessboard of our time. All right, fourth up this week, battle in Beichu. So the Vatican's trial of the century continues to lumber on. This is the civil trial before the Vatican Tribunal involving charges of financial corruption and embezzlement and so on against 10 defendants, including for the first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Beciu. Now, throughout this process, Beciu has vigorously maintained his innocence. He is, I think, the only defendant who has actually showed up at every hearing of the court so far, and there have been more than 50 now. Last week was sort of a difficult week for Beciu because last week, the prosecution introduced in evidence an exchange of letters between Beichu and Pope Francis in the summer of 2020, when the indictments against Beichu and the other defendants were first made or first issued. And this correspondence did not really put Beichu in a good light. It made it look like he was trying to get Pope Francis to sign off on a couple of statements that Beichu had drafted. One about secret payments the Vatican made to try to ransom a Colombian nun who had been kidnapped by jihadists in the African nation of Mali, the intermediary for which was a 
self-proclaimed Italian security consultant by the name of Cecilia Marogna, friend of Cardinal Beciu. And the other document had to do with the failed $400 million land deal in London that the Vatican Secretary of State had entered into. The gist of last week's evidence was it looked like Beciu was trying to paint the Pope into a corner, get him to sign documents to, to get Beciu off the hook, and that the Pope refused. So Beciu, this week, presented a statement before the tribunal in which he said, well, the thing that prosecutors forgot to include in the letters that they deposited is a previous letter from Pope Francis to Beciu in which Pope Francis says, after a phone call, listen, why don't you write up what you want me to sign and get it to me, and I'll take a look at it. So in other words, Beciu's point is, this wasn't him out of a clear blue sky trying to force the Pope's hand. He was responding to a specific request from the Pope to draft stamp. Doesn't change the fact that the Pope refused to sign what Beciu put in front of him, but it does make it look, I suppose, slightly less seamy that Beciu wasn't, this wasn't his idea, but that he was responding to a specific papal request. Probably the more interesting thing from the testimony this week is that the court heard from Beciu's successor as the Pope's chief of staff, Venezuelan Archbishop Edgar Peña Parra. Peña Parra testified that he didn't understand why the Vatican Bank ultimately refused to make a loan to the Secretary of State to help it buy its way out of the London deal. And in fact, made a report to prosecutors that resulted in this trial. Peña Parra said that he didn't feel like the Secretary of State had done anything wrong, that in fact their request for this loan was entirely justified. He said the Vatican was spending a million euro a month to service the interest on this London deal. They needed to get out of it, and he felt like the Vatican Bank had forced them to go on making those payments for months unnecessarily. Peña Parra said he actually suspected that the Vatican Bank might be in cahoots with one of the Italian, shady Italian businessmen who eventually got indicted in this whole thing, Gianluigi Torzi. He said his worry was that Torzi, having been thrown out the front door, might have come back in the deal through the back window. And so Peña Parra said he actually commissioned an investigation of the Vatican Bank and said, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it again. The gist is, Peña Parra was saying he doesn't feel like the Secretary of State, meaning that would include the conduct of Cardinal Beciu, he doesn't feel like they did anything wrong. We'll see how all this plays out. But it is nevertheless fascinating that this is at least one case in which a cardinal is not following that time-honored script of falling on his sword and taking the hit for the system. But instead, Bei Chu is fighting back vigorously with every tool at his disposal. We'll see how all this wraps up. Finally, this week, baseball and brotherhood. So the World Baseball Classic is going on right now. This is when teams representing the various nations of the world who have qualified come together and it's like the World Cup of baseball, huh? We're right now in the quarterfinal stage. Over the weekend, we'll have the semifinals. Well, sorry, actually, I am speaking out of time because by the time you see this, the championship game will be set for tonight, basically, Tuesday night. But in any event, Italy had a fairly good run. They went two and two through the opening round. That was enough to qualify them to move on to the quarterfinals where, unfortunately, they ran into mighty Japan, a team that's favored to win it all, and they lost 9-3, to and so they're out. Now, I have to say that despite the fact that this performance didn't exactly, I don't know, set the world on fire, nevertheless, it certainly stirred my imagination because the manager of the Italian team is an Italian-American, Mike Piazza, the legendary catcher who played for the Mets and the Dodgers, in the States. You'll remember the home run Piazza hit in the 1988 World Series for the Dodgers, probably one of the most iconic moments in all of baseball history. Hit it off reliever Dennis Eckersley. And the roster of the Italian team was made up not quite entirely, but certainly from a majority point of view, made up of Italian Americans. 
who have played, who were born, grew up in the States, played their ball in the States, but nevertheless have Italian roots. It is a reminder of how baseball is a force historically that has always knitted the United States and Italy together. Baseball arrived in Italy during the Second World War. The American troops landed at Anzio, about an hour south of Rome, and made their way up north for the liberation of Rome in 1944. Afterwards, a cemetery for the American dead was created in Anzio. The caretaker there, an American soldier, or former soldier by the name of Horace McGinty, founded a baseball club in the nearby town of Netuno and began to teach baseball to young Italians. And that's how an Italian professional baseball league was born. It was basically an American import. And if you think about the story of American baseball and all the Italian-American giants, you know, who, are the, who formed the greats of the game, guys like Tony Lazzari and Phil Rizzuto and Vic Rasky and Yogi Berra, Roy Campanella, Joe DiMaggio, his brother Dom DiMaggio, who people forget, but was, in, was an all-star for the Boston Red Sox for a long time. All of those guys were dominating the game at the same time that it was first arriving in Italy. And it therefore is something that knits the two sides of the Atlantic together. In fact, I would argue that in the United States, there are only three routine acts, three acts that ordinary Americans commit on a fairly regular basis that connect them directly to Italy. One would be going to a Catholic mass, where, of course, you pray for the Pope in Rome. Second would be having an Italian meal. Italian cuisine is a multi-billion dollar industry in America, and at least for an hour or so, every American who sits down to have a plate of pasta can feel a little bit of Italian. And the third is going to a baseball game. And so this week, I had the opportunity to bring together, aside from my wife, Elise, the three great passions of my life, the Catholic Church, baseball, and food. Thursday, when Italy played Japan, I went to Mass that morning, watched the game, not so happy with the outcome, but nevertheless, cheered my heart out for the sons of Italy, the Fratelli d'Italia, and then made rigatoni alla norcina for lunch. And it sort of felt like the two sides of my soul, the American side and the Italian side, came together in perfect harmony that one day. So while Italy's dream may be dead for this world baseball classic, all I have to say in the future going forward, Forza Italia. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories and much, much more on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Again, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. We will be with you next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again very soon.